Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to show um, ill-posedness of the 1D heat equation for initial condition inversion. So stated here is our PDE. So we have partial U partial T minus K del squared U is zero, where K is a diffusivity field. In theory, this can be K of X, but for simplicity here, we're just gonna assume K is a constant. We're on um, an interval in the X domain zero to L and an interval in the time domain zero to T. Then we have an initial condition given by a function m of x, and this is what we will invert for. So this is a field defined on 0 to L. And then finally, I give you zero boundary conditions for x equals 0 and x equals L for all times t uh, that's equal to 0. And then finally, our forward model is to first solve the PDE to get u and evaluate at this final time t. And I put this semicolon m here to just say, okay, well, look, this is a function of x and t, but depending on what I give you as an initial condition, the u that you get out is possibly different. Okay, so then, again, the, that's, that's our uh, forward model. Solve the PDE and evaluate at that final time t. And then, um, sorry, um, our... Uh, Inverse map here is phi of d equals m if and only if f of m approximately equals d. And in, for the context of this video, we'll eventually get to what it means to do this approximately equals, but I'm going to consider here when it's exactly equal to d. We, we solve for the exact inverse in this context. Um, because again, later on, we'll show that this approximately equals d is what we need because of this ill posedness. So if it wasn't ill-posed, we could solve this exactly. Um, so let's go ahead and try to construct what this f of m looks like. So for this particular problem, it'll actually end up being pretty nice. So u of 0 t equals u of l t is 0 implies that I have a Fourier series rep representation. So I'm going to let vn be the square root of 2 over L times sine of n pi over Lx. Vn of x equals this. Okay, so this is going to be my orthonormal basis. And the zero boundary condition tells me that um, the, the Fourier series only has these sine components, right? So it's a periodic function that's zero on the boundary, so we know that u of x and t is equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of some coefficients, because I only have the Fourier basis in the, the um, x domain, um, uh, so these are, these are coefficients that might change with time. So let's solve for these coefficients. We know from the differential equation that this is true. So that del squared, we're in one dimension, so it's just this. So if I take that form of the equation, this tells me alpha n prime of t plus k n pi over l squared alpha n of t vn is 0 for all t, and let's define for f and g um, the inner product is this. So um, the analog, if you haven't seen that notation before, is just this is what uh, uh, the inner product of two functions would look like. So here we're multiplying f of x, g of x. But now, since they're a continuous function, we integrate rather than sum. That's, that's all that's going on here, if you haven't seen that before. So uh, the main thing with a Fourier series is that vi vj is equal to delta ij, which is 
1 if i equals j and 0 if i is not equal to j. So the right-hand side, I can dot product vj on both sides of this equation. And then the, the right-hand side is just zero, so the dot product is, is zero, or the inner product. And then this is delta, this is delta nj. And so this whole thing here, I'll switch colors here, says that alpha, alpha j prime, everything except for when n equals j disappears, And so this actually tells me that alpha j of t is equal to um, some constant c times e, let's call it cj, e to the minus k j pi over l squared t. So we have those functions, and I'm going to go ahead and put this cj. I'm going to pull it out. I want to define these ejs like this, because um, we'll, we'll get the coefficients later. So ej is this. Uh, vn is this. those functions. So now we have a well-defined uh, forward map. Uh, well, not quite. So uh, let's switch to this color of purple. So we also know that u, okay, so u of x and t is the sum n equals 1 to infinity. And I'm going to put the cn here. That's why I wanted to do that. Alpha n of t v n of x, and I know that u of x and 0 is m of x from our initial condition. And alpha n of 0 is 1, so I know that this is c n v n of x. Okay, then from here I dot product m with v j is the sum of the cn, vn, vj. So this is a standard calculation you see with Fourier series. This is cj. So that is precisely what our cj's are, is we just integrate m against our vj's. So now we can, given an input m, in short, if I give you an initial condition m, f of m is u Okay, sorry. u of xt parameterized by that n, is the sum n equals 1 to infinity of m dotted with vn alpha n of t vn of x, where, again, vn of x is square root 2 over l sine n pi over lx, and alpha n of t is e to the minus k n pi over l squared. Sorry, not x, t. Okay. So this tells me that f of m, which is just take that and evaluate at the terminal time t, is m v n 
alpha n of capital T, v n of x. So in short, we have this. Okay, so what does phi of d look like? We have the forward model. What's its inverse? Well, you'll notice that this looks a lot like, uh, so, to, so to get my coefficients, I have this orthonormal basis Vn, okay? And how do you get from a standard basis into an orthonormal basis uh, that's possibly different? Well, you dot product into each basis vector um, and uh, um, multiply by, by the new basis. So this operator is diagonal in, in this basis is basically, um, what this shows. So F inverse so phi is F inverse because we're doing exact equality here. And we know that F is a diagonal operator. So uh, I dot product into Vn, I multiply by Vn, but then I possibly scale, I scale each component by this. That's what a diagonal operator looks like. So F inverse looks like this. It's just dVn one over alpha n of t vn of x. And if you don't buy this, um, try it. Try taking f of what I've now defined f phi of d. Does that equal d? And you can check it and it, it will turn out to be true that that is the case. But the point is we now have a well-defined inverse operator here. So this is a simplified problem. Typically you can't, you know, directly construct it like this. But for this particular problem, this is why this is a nice example. Okay, so recall that these alpha n's look like this. So 1 over alpha n, 1 over alpha n of t is e to the k n pi over l squared capital T. So these are eigenvalues. Right, because this is a diagonal operator in, in the in the basis, um, so its diagonal elements are, are eigenvalues. These are large. These grow exponentially with n. Okay, and this is the source. of instability. Okay, so let's show and I'll use IP, that means inverse or of the inverse problem. So anytime I say IP, that means inverse problem. It looks like intellectual property, but so let's go ahead and prove that this is in fact, in fact, in fact, a um, phi is discontinuous. So again, that's what instability means. So stability means phi is continuous. Instability means it is discontinuous. So let's show that it's discontinuous. So I'm going to let... Um, Uh, I'm going to let D be any data. I'm going to show it's discontinuous at every point. And I'm going to let delta D be epsilon times Vn. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to call it delta dn. So I perturb um, in the nth eigendirection. Then phi of d plus delta dn minus phi of delta dn is equal to, okay, so this is a linear operator, right? So they differ only in the nth component. So their difference is exactly epsilon vn dotted into vn, 1 over alpha n of tn times vn. Okay, they're an orthonormal basis, so this is just epsilon over alpha n of t vn. Okay, then finally, let's look at the, the L2 norm of these. So I'm going to look at the L2 norm of 0 to L. Uh, and let's square it for simplicity. Or we don't, let's not square it. So this is a constant. And this L2 norm is uh, 1, because they're an orthonormal basis in the L2 norm. So this is L epsilon over alpha n of t. OK, so and then similarly, delta dn in the L2 norm is epsilon. So we perturb our solution by some parameter epsilon. OK, and we get out that we are getting kt n pi over L squared. OK, so we can perturb. There's a sequence of perturbations such that we can get larger and larger and larger um, difference in the inverse problem, arbitrarily large. So if you say, I want to get 10 to the 10th error, and, but you are only allowed to perturb, um, oh, sorry. So I'm looking at the relative error. Uh, well, uh, I guess it doesn't even really matter too much. So, right, this parameter epsilon, you, you say, I'm only going to allow you to perturb the solution by 10 to the minus 30 in the L2 norm. Uh, can you give me an error of 10 to the 10th? The answer is yes, because this term always goes to infinity. Um, so no matter how small this epsilon is, I can always get it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and that, that shows instability. Uh, that it's not not continuous. Um, and so this is, again, this is in the exact case. We have explicitly computed this is an exact solution. So even when we get down to discretization, uh, that, that makes it even worse. And so the whole theme here is that if we can't even do this exactly with small perturbations, just with a tiny bit of noise in our data, um, then the question is, is this hopeless? And uh, the answer is not necessarily. We need to address this issue. Um, um, so I'll talk a little bit more about noise in the next video and, and how we get around this, this issue. And I hope to see you guys there. Thanks for watching.